execution, execution, execution. That's my discussion today. But to do that, I must discuss two other things that are important for us to embrace implementation. Number one is vision. The second one is strategy. And then after those two, then we can talk about implementation, implementation, and more implementation together with the notion of monitoring and evaluation. As individuals, as managers, as political leaders, as mothers, as fathers, we must have a vision, a description of the future we want. As an organization, as an institution, you must have a vision, a destination, the house on the top of the hill, so that you can say, I want to move from where I am to the house on the top of the hill. As a nation, you must have a destination economy, a national vision, the National Development Plan for South Africa, NDP, Vision 2030, a painting of that house on the top of the hill, our national vision as South Africans. Spend some time crafting the vision. Spend some time as a company developing your destination. Beyond the country, it's not enough, Dr. Posa, for you to have a national vision, then DP. We are now talking about continental integration, the Pan-African vision. Where do we want the African continent to be in the year 2063, Agenda 2063? That is the continental vision. National competitiveness is so yesterday. National attractiveness is so yesterday. We are talking about regional attractiveness. We are talking about regional competitiveness. South Africa won't be attractive if Botswana is not attractive. South Africa won't be competitive if Zimbabwe is misgoverned by me. <laughs> an investor sitting in Japan, an investor in New York will say, I can't go to South Africa. There are only 55 million people. It's chicken change. I want a market of 300 million people. That is your SADAC. I want a market for 600 million people. That's your FTA area. When you have a market of 600 million people, you make more sense to China with their 1.3 billion people. Regional vision. Continental vision. 1.1 billion Africans. Dr. Posa. 1.1 billion people. If you were to go to Japan, go to China, go to America and say, here I come. I'm the new president of South Africa. I'm representing 1.1 billion Africans. The Russians will listen to you. The Chinese will listen to you. The Americans will listen to you, not out of love, out of economics. Because you present a market of 1.1 billion people. I'm emphasizing the importance of continental vision in addition to national vision. The NDP, yes, but tie in the NDP to Agenda 2063. The importance of the dream, the importance of a national vision. Now, there's a small one which we need to correct. I went to listen to Ciro uh, a couple of days ago at Gibbs, where he was speaking to business leaders. He spoke very well about the vision and emphasizing that the governing party is having a policy conference, the governing party, gov the national vision must be above party. The national vision must have buy-in from every political party in South Africa. 
I know largely the NDP has been adopted by all parties, DA, this one, but I understand EFF hasn't. You must care. You must care that the EFF hasn't adopted. Ideally, what we want in South Africa is for all the political parties to say the NDP is our national vision. All of us. We might differ on how to get to the vision, but none of us must challenge the vision. So work extra hard, my comrades in the NC, to make sure that the EFF is on board on the NDP. You must care that they are not on board. In fact, it's too late now. Ideally, the crafting of the NDP should it be done by technocrats, yes, Ciro and, uh, uh, um, and Trevor, but there should have been also the big brains from the political parties. So that when you are done, you say, here is our national development plan, as political parties, as business, as civic society, as academics. But it doesn't matter, we now have the plan. But let us make sure that everyone is on board, not just the governing party. Don't tell me the governing <laughs> The governing party can lose elections. We don't want to change our destination just because the ANC has lost elections. The destination must remain the same under the DA. The destination must remain the same under the EFF and Julius Malema. That is a sustainable vision. Brand South Africa, brand. There's a link between vision and brand. You cannot have a national vision without a good national brand. You can't have a good national brand without a national vision. The two are linked together. Your competitive identity is your national brand. What you're known for in six areas, tourism, trade, investment, people, governance, culture, the hexagon of branding. Let's make sure the NDP is intellectually and physically linked to brand South Africa. The link between the national vision and the national brand. That's what we need to do at a national level. But remember, I said, as a mother, have your destination economy. As a company, have your own vision. We are done with vision. Now, once you have a vision, the question is, how can I achieve the vision? I'm sitting at point A. My destination is B, which is my vision. How do I move from A to B? How do I move from where I am today to the vision in 2030? That is the definition of what you call strategy the game plan, the movement from A to B is what we call strategy. So number one, craft your national vision, craft your organizational vision, craft your personal vision. And then the next step says, how do I move from where I am to my destination? The game plan, the strategy, strategy, strategy. Now, this is another overused word, Dr. Posa. We need to understand what we mean by strategy. Five conditions. Every time your manager, your political leader, your mother uses the word strategy, ask them, does it satisfy five conditions? Five, and I'm going to give you five conditions. Number one, for a strategy to be a strategy, it must have a unique value proposition which is different from the competitors. Ask your mother, ask your MD, ask your president. What is the unique value proposition that's being offered which is different from the competitors? That's number one. Number two, what are the distinctive activities we're going to carry out to achieve the unique value proposition. That's condition number two for a strategy. Number three, what are the trade-offs? What are you going to do differently? If you can't tell me 
what you're going to do differently, then you have no strategy. And I'll give you some examples to dramatize the need for trade-offs. If you can't show me what money you're walking away from, you can't make money. You can't be everything to all people. Make hard choices. An example, you know about insurance, right? Driving insurance. When you go and buy insurance, normally they ask you, how many accidents have you had? Are you a good driver? And they give you insurance. Now, in the U.S., there's a very profitable company that has gone the other way. They ask you, are you a good driver? How many accidents have you had? If you're a good driver, they don't want you. If you're, if you're like Posa, who has got 10 accidents every year, they say, come, 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 you are our favorite customer. So they want the bad drivers. Come. And they sell insurance to the bad drivers and also a funeral policy. <laughs> but guess what? They're very profitable. They've chosen the bad driver and they've given up on the good driver and made serious money. You've heard about Southwest Airlines. They're the creators of the low-cost airline model. There's no food on their airlines. There's no first class on their airlines. There's no check-in luggage. It's like an ET, like an emergency taxi in air. <laughs> They've given up on the man of the superstar, the bowlers like Posa, who want food, who want first class. Go elsewhere with your money. We want the poor woman and poor man who's broke as hell but want to fly. But guess what? They are the most profitable airline in the U.S. They've given up on the money from the rich people, and they're going for the poor men and poor women, and they're making a lot of money. I'm emphasizing the notion of trade-offs. Show me the money you are walking away from. Then I can show you the money you're going to make. Trade-offs. Number four, mutually reinforcing activities. When you say strategy, you must demonstrate the mutually reinforcing activities which will allow you to deliver the unique value proposition. Uh, for the airline, for example, they don't save food, they have low fares, they turn their airlines back in 30 minutes. Those are the mutually reinforcing activities that allow them to do their model. And then the last one, number five, is what we call continuity of strategic position. Strategy is for the long haul. The NDP is until 2030. You don't change it every week. It's a long-term strategy. Strategy 2063, 50 years from 2013. Strategy is for the long haul. Your strategy as a father, your strategy as a company, your strategy as a country does not change every week. It's for the long haul. However, you have continuous improvement. You adopt new technologies. But the general direction doesn't change. That is strategy. Now we go to our favorite subject. Execution, execution, execution. You've had the big debate at business school, Harvard Business School, London Business School, WITS, and UCT. What is more important, strategy or execution? And professors and academics are busy debating back and forth. The answer is very simple. Execution is strategy. So if you are not executing, you have no strategy. So don't worry about the debate. What is more important, strategy or execution? Execution is strategy. So if you are not doing things, in government, if you're not doing things in your company, if you're not doing things at a personal level, you have no strategy. Doing things is more important than dreaming. Doing things is more important than planning. It's better to have a poor strategy, which is vigorously implemented than having a perfect strategy which is never implemented. Bear that in mind. Don't do what is called paralysis of analysis. Busy analyzing, SWOT analysis, feasibility studies, 
no action. Now, let's talk to the freedom fighters in the house. Imagine the year is 1960. We have Gavin Becky, Oliver Tambo, and Nelson Mandela. They're sitting in a room doing a SWOT analysis, doing a feasibility study. Here's the question. Nelson, Gavin, Oliver, can the Boers be defeated? Analyze. <laughs> Do a SWOT analysis. Use McKinsey, Baines, whatever tools you have. Tell us. And, and Gavin and uh, Oliver and Nelson are doing a SWOT analysis. What will be the answer? Uh, gentlemen and ladies, it can't be done. The Boers are so strong. I think let us concentrate on our law firm. It can never be done. <laughs> All I'm saying is, please, don't overdo the feasibility study. Take a plunge. Sometimes you win. You go to jail for 27 years. Some people die in the process. But in 1994, 34 years later, something is achieved. So yes to analysis, yes to feasibility studies, but at some point, just take a plunge and do it. Because otherwise, the answer from 1960 or from 1950 will be, don't do it, it can't be done. MK, Zipra, Zanla, don't shoot guns, it can't be done. Go and work as gardeners, go and work as maids, go and just suffer the system because it's impossible. Execution, 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 even if the odds are stacked against you, let us do things. Now, what is the framework of execution? How do you execute? You must have what is called an implementation matrix. An implementation matrix. Right there. Number one, who is going to do what? Identify the doer. Two, when are they going to do it? Identify the time frame. Number three, identify signposts, milestones. In three years, we'd have done the following. In four years, the following. In 13 years, in 2030, we've arrived. Clear milestones, measurements, metrics, success or failure, feedback into the system, monitoring and evaluation. That's why we have a department in the country for monitoring and evaluation. Because you do things, you identify the doer, you identify the time frame, you identify the milestones, you measure success and progress or lack of it, you monitor, you evaluate, you feedback. Execution, execution, execution. It's a science. There must be a methodolog methodological way of approaching execution. And we must monitor and measure. But you know what? You must be very creative in the way you measure things. Traditional ways won't work. GDP, per capita income, not good enough. Tell me about the gene coefficient. Tell me about the size of middle class. Tell me about the number of bridges. Tell me about the number of power stations. Tell me about cell phone penetration. Tell me about power per capita. Tell me about water per capita. These are new numbers that Harvard is not measuring. This is not measuring. You must measure. Those guys are so yesterday. This business school, Harvard business school, MIT, they're not good enough. I want to know the length of Tad Road in Mpumalanga. I want to know the number of bridges in Tanzania. I want to know the number of power stations we need in South Africa to achieve Vision 2030. How many high schools do we need? How many universities? 
and what caliber and quality of student and product we're going to get. We need to be creative around measurements. It can't be business as usual. Let's measure different things that we need to build economies, that we need to drive economies. Implementation, implementation, gender justice. I hope you have seen the memo. I hope you have seen the research. Women are better managers than men. Oh, you haven't seen it? Welcome to wisdom. <laughs> Women are better leaders. <laughs> Women are better leaders than men. I, I, I'll share with you the research. Uh, future, the future president, sorry. Uh, future president, maybe a woman will be do a better job than Cyril and Matthews. So when we empower women, we're not doing them a favor. We're doing ourselves a favor. In your company, in your country, when you empower women to become ministers, to become DGs, to become president of the country, you are doing yourself a favor because there'll be better performance, better profitability, better cash for yourself, for the company and the country. I'm saying women rights are human rights. But it's more than human rights. It's about economics. Empowering women is smart economics. The gender dividend. You can measure it. So as we execute, as we implement, let us make sure that there's a special space for gender justice and for young people. What's called the youth dividend. As I conclude, let me emphasize the importance of working together. We must make sure we work as Team South Africa. Civic society, business, and government. Everyone must put their head together. All the political parties must work together in an inclusive Team South Africa approach. There is no winner in a losing team. We must all win. We're going to sink or swim together. But more than that, I want to appeal to you as South Africa to think continental, to think Africa. You can't make it as South Africa alone while little Botswana is starving. Let's go back to the founding fathers of Pan-Africanism, Kruma, and I quote him. We as Ghanaians are prepared to surrender our sovereignty in part or in total in pursuit of African unity. Close court. Second court. The independence of Ghana is meaningless. Let it, it is linked to the independence of the rest of Africa. Close court. Ben Bela, that's Kuma. Ben Bela from Algeria. This is what he said. Let us die a little so that South Africa can be free. Let us die a little so that Rhodesia can be free. Now, fast forward to 2017. We must be saying the prosperity of South Africa is meaningless unless it is linked to the prosperity of the rest of the African continent. The prosperity of South Africa is meaningless unless it is linked to the prosperity of the rest of the African continent. And also, you will never be respected as an African until Africa has done well as a continent. You know, uh, Brother Posa, I go to Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum, and I like talking, as you can see. And I'm talking at Davos. They're very interested. Hey, that's interesting, my brother. Where are you from? I refuse to say. I continue talking. 
we like what you're saying. Where are you from? Then eventually I say, hey, I'm from Zimbabwe. Ah, oh, my brother, you're from Zimbabwe. <laughs> Tell us about cholera in Zimbabwe. Tell us about corruption in Zimbabwe. Tell us about your next elections. No, 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 no. You are not a professor of robotics and mechatronics. You are a professor of cholera. My own personal brand is hugely damaged by the brand of my own country. You as an African, you will never be respected as an African on planet Earth unless every African is doing well. This is a message to President Zuma, to Obama, to Oprah Winfrey, to Michael Jordan, to me. I thank you so very much. <laughs> Vision 2030, the National Development Plan. It's our future. Let's go for it, man.